Consume them in wrath. Consume them till they are no more, that they may know that God rules over Jacob to the ends of the earth. Psalm 59, 13. Pour out your anger on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call upon your name. Psalm 79, 6. Appoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be counted as sin. What is your gut reaction to these verses? These are verses from imprecatory psalms. An imprecation is another word for a curse. In these psalms, the authors, the psalmists, they call down judgment upon God's enemies. Now, I like to sing from the psalms. Some of my favorite songs are just psalms put to music. I like to read from the psalms. I like to pray from the psalms, and I like to preach from the psalms. But these verses we just read, and more like them, don't fill me with the same feeling I get when I read Psalm 1, Psalm 23, Psalm 46, Psalm 100, or any other comforting psalm. To be honest, I'm not that interested in singing songs about God punishing others. There's a sad day coming is the first song lyric that comes to my mind close to this, and I don't like that song very much. There's a sad day coming. As a part of the song, there's a great day coming. Uh, Like the rest of the psalms, these imprecatory psalms, they were sung publicly by God's people. Uh, The imprecatory psalms include uh, Psalm 55, 59, 69, 79, 109, and 137. Tonight we're going to center in on one in particular, Psalm 69. If you would turn there, and we'll read it together. Psalm 69. And we're just going to focus on a few verses out of this entire psalm, verses 22 through 28. Let's read it together. David wrote this psalm, and starting in verse 22, he wrote, Let their own table before them become a snare, and when they are at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see, and make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them, and let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents, for they persecute him whom you have struck down, and they recount the pain of those you have wounded. Add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. What are Christians supposed to do with this? Have any of your prayers ever sounded like David's prayer here? These are some challenging scriptures. Um, And even after tonight, after this sermon, if you continue to wrestle with the imprecatory psalms, I encourage you to look at the information published by Christian Courier on the matter. Um, They've helped me in preparing for this. The truth is that all Scripture is inspired by God, breathed out by God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. These words penned by David were breathed out by God. They have value to us, and if we're going to be faithful students of God's Word, uh, we have to engage even the parts of Scripture that make us uncomfortable. So for the next few minutes, we're going to wrestle with this difficult piece of Scripture and remind ourselves of several biblical truths. Uh, And then hopefully answer the question, what is a Christian supposed to do? How do we respond? How do we apply or learn from these imprecatory psalms? And one truth we learn from reading Psalm 69, verses 22 and 28, and other psalms like these, is that many people walk as enemies of God. God's enemies are the object of these verses. And who specifically is David referring to as he writes this? Who does he have in mind as he's writing these imprecations? 
Uh, we can't know for sure. There is one immediate possibility, uh, and you would might guess this as well. It might be Saul. Naturally, many commentators uh, and scholars think David could be referring to Saul and Saul's army. David was loved by Israel. He outperformed Saul in all of his successes. Uh, Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands is what people would sing. And because of this, Saul was jealous. Saul was angry. Saul was murderous towards David. Saul was one of David's enemies. And this psalm may or may not be about Saul. There are some imprecatory psalms elsewhere that are about Saul. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1 real quick. Acts chapter 1 answers the question for us. Who is this psalm written about? So there was the immediate fulfillment that we could speculate was Saul in David's original context. Uh, but there's more to this psalm than its immediate context. In Acts chapter 1, the question, who is this psalm about, is answered directly and outright. Acts chapter 1, let's read verses 15 and 16. This is right after Jesus had ascended into heaven, and the apostles are going to pick a new apostle to join them, a twelfth. Acts chapter 1, verse 15. In those days Peter stood up among the brothers, the company of persons was in all about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. Skip to verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it. Verse 16 of Acts chapter 1 said, the Holy Spirit spoke Psalm 69 from the mouth of David. Now, 2 Timothy 3.16 affirms that all scripture is inspired by God. Acts 1.16 affirms that Psalm Chapter 69, verse 25, specifically is inspired by God. In Scripture, God doubly affirms the inspiration of this imprecatory psalm. The imprecatory psalms are inspired by God. And Acts chapter 1, verse 20, reveals that the psalm in question, at least in its ultimate fulfillment, was about Judas. He was an apostle of Christ. Judas was blessed to walk by his side. And rather than follow Jesus, Judas betrayed him. He suffered the consequences of his disobedience. So we can't leave the harsh language of the imprecatory Psalms in the Old Testament. They follow us into the New Testament. And it doesn't end there. Turn to Romans chapter 11 with me. Romans 11, David's imprecatory psalm finds even more fulfillment in the next book of the Bible. Romans chapter 11, we're going to read verses 9 and 10. In Romans chapter 11, Paul is writing about people of Jewish lineage who have rejected the gospel of Christ. Romans chapter 11, starting in verse 9, and David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see, and bend their backs forever. Psalm chapter 69, verses 22 and 23, is about the unfaithful Israelites. God had intended for them to be the first to receive the gift of salvation in Christ. Instead of receiving Christ, they killed him, and they have suffered the consequences of such gross disobedience. So who is this imprecatory psalm we're studying tonight about? It had an immediate context. It may have been someone like Saul. Uh, the New Testament affirms that an ultimate fulfillment uh, reveals. It was about Judas. It was about unfaithful uh, Israelites. Saul, Judas, and the Jews who rejected the gospel, they positioned themselves as enemies of God. Elsewhere in Scripture, Paul writes about those who even today walk as enemies of God. Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19 says, For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, 
walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. So a truth true today is that many people walk as enemies of Christ. Their end is destruction. They serve their own desires. Above all else, the stuff they should be ashamed about, they take pride in, uh, and their minds grovel on earthly things. What should our attitudes towards these people, towards those who walk as enemies of God, what should our attitude be? We can do like Paul did as he wrote Philippians chapter 3, verse 18. We can weep with him. We can be sad. And perhaps the Philippians received his letter uh, with wrinkles where Paul's tears had fallen. As Paul wrote, he was feeling the exact same way God feels towards those who walk as his enemies. In Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, God said, Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? God has the same attitude in the New Testament. 1 Timothy 2, 4, God desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God desires for the wicked to turn back. God desires for all people to be saved. God desires all people to know the truth, and God desires all people to reach repentance. God desires that enemies be turned in to friends. He desires that enemies be turned into friends, and we should desire the same. The New Testament is very, very clear on how Christians are to treat our enemies. And as we wrestle with an imprecatory psalm, we must never, never minimize love. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 44, Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Bless those who persecute you and do not curse them, Paul wrote in Romans 12, 14. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, Romans 12, 20. Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 7. 37. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. John 13, starting in verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 1 John 4, 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. If we come face to face with our enemies and meet them without love, we've met them without God. If we meet our enemies without love, we've joined them in sin. One word that I've been trying to reduce from my vocabulary is the word but, B-U-T. The word but is a great word to communicate to someone that you are not genuine. If you say to someone who's suffering, I can see that you're hurting, but if we respond to someone else's pain with, but we've stopped listening, empathy is off the table, and we've closed the door to a relationship. If we say, I love you, but... That's awful. That's dangerous. If we tell someone, I love you, but we've declared that there are limits to our love, and we're communicating that whoever we're talking to is not fully loved. We have to keep these things in mind as we read the imprecatory Psalms. Love is central and foundational, not just to our faith, but to who God is. Psalm chapter 69, verses 22 to 28 specifically, are inspired by God. God is love. And these words do not communicate an absence of love as much as we may wrestle with them. We should never minimize love. 
and at the same time, we should never misunderstand love. The imprecatory psalms are not an I love you, but suffer this punishment. I love you, but I want this bad thing to happen to you. There are no buts to God's love, and there are no buts to God's people's love for others. God's love is boundless. God's judgment does not stand in opposition to his love. And the judgment David calls for in the imprecatory Psalms are not incompatible with the kind of love that Christ showed in the New Testament. And that leads us into this second point. God is right to punish evil. God is right to punish evil. If you would, uh, let's read a short story in 2 Chronicles chapter 36. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Zedekiah was a king of Judah, and he was a bad one at that. Uh, God's people at this time, we read, uh, they followed the abominations of all the nations, all the abominations of the nations. They were no different than any other group of people living in the world. And look at what God did in 2 Chronicles verses, chapter 36, verses 15 to 17. The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people, until there was no remedy. Verse 17, therefore he brought up against them, the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion, the king had no compassion, on young man or virgin, old man or aged. He gave them all into his hand. God showed his love and compassion for the people of Jerusalem by calling them to repentance. They were living in a way uh, that was an abomination to God. They followed the abomination of the nations. Like Jesus uh, would, or like they would do Jesus, God's people rejected his loving invitation for them to repent of sin. God in his compassion sent them messengers and said, hey, stop what you're doing, repent. And they rejected the messengers. They chose to walk as enemies of God, they refused to repent, and they were treated justly as enemies of God. These are the same type of people uh, that the imprecatory Psalms are about. Psalm chapter 69 verses 22 to 28 is written about people who would not repent. An important note to know about the imprecatory Psalms, they are all written towards those who will not repent repent. God's attitude towards Zedekiah and the people living with him is the same attitude he has towards us. He has compassion on us, and he has sent a great messenger calling us to repentance and salvation. Turn to the book of Romans again with me. Romans chapter 3. Romans 3. Starting in verse 21, it's written, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption of that is, in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of one who has faith in Jesus. How can we know that God is right? How can we know that God is just? This passage answers it for us because of Jesus. Us. Verse 23 is about us, for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. But we read, Christians are justified by grace. 
Christians receive justification through obedient faith. Through Christ, God demonstrates his righteousness and judgment. Like God sent messengers to Zedekiah and Zedekiah's people, God has sent Jesus to us in compassion by his love, calling sinners to repentance. When Jackson wrote uh, on this scripture specifically, Romans chapter 3, no one can argue logically against the benevolence of Jehovah in light of the cross. The holiness and justice of deity demand that sin be addressed. Appropriate reward for good and evil is an evidence that there is a God that judges in the earth. In Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26, Paul affirmed that God has shown his righteousness in sending Christ as a propitiation for sin. In this loving act, he preserves his own righteousness, yet at the same time becomes the justifier of those who through faith are obedient to his Son. God is right. God is just. And if he did not punish evil, he would be doing injustice. And it's important at this point to note, the imprecatory psalms are not written as a matter of personal revenge. In Romans chapter 12, 19, Paul quoted God as he wrote, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. When David wrote the imprecatory psalms, he wasn't attempting to avenge himself. He was praying that God would do what God said he would do. He was praying that God would act according to his divine will. God's people pray for his will to be done. Like God, we desire that all people come to repentance. That's why we show love. We want people uh, to repent, and we hope by our example they will be led to Christ. And like God, we know that it is right for those who will not repent to be punished. So what should we make of imprecatory psalms like Psalm 69? Should we adopt this kind of language? Should we pray more imprecatory prayers? Should we sing more songs of judgment? Uh, one thing important to know is that the Hebrew poetry of the imprecatory psalms, one writer said about them, uh, the English reader must understand that Hebrew poetry used extravagant language that is often exaggerated, passionate, and pictur picturesque, not intended to be taken literally. So that's helping us put together how do we respond to this psalm, how do we apply it. It's inspired by God and profitable in some way for us. Uh, we've got to realize uh, that these are Hebrew poetry. This is Hebrew poetry. Another writer said, it must be recognized that the Hebrew language is a very graphic medium of communication, rich in bold metaphors designed to display the passion of burning religious zeal, and one must be careful not to literalize every exp expression. So I'd encourage you, don't look to these psalms for a new arsenal of colorful words to use against your enemies. Um, but we still have to answer the question, should we pray imprecatory prayers at all? Should we pray imprecatory prayers? As I hope to answer this question from Scripture, I'm very, very thankful that Jesus told us how to pray. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, Jesus said, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, we're not only praying for our salvation, we're praying for the final destruction of God's enemies and those who walk as enemies of God. Sometimes we use Revelation chapter 22, verse 20, as a passage of comfort in which John writes, Come, Lord Jesus. Do you know what happens when Jesus comes again? What is right and what is just will be done. Even in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, we see people in heaven crying out for God to enact justice. The martyrs, people who have died for the Christian faith, they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign God, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Even the martyrs in heaven cry out 
for justice. Here are three important points. We've mentioned them all, uh, but I wanted to bring them together at the end uh, so you can see them all at once and we can understand these types of psalms a little bit better. The imprecatory psalms are inspired by God. They're profitable uh, to us in our faith. They're written about those who will not repent. Like God, we desire that all people come to repentance. Um, these psalms are written about those who will not repent. They are not written as a matter of personal revenge. If we spoke words like David spoke, but we did them out of personal vengeance to people we don't like because of personal wrongs, without an attitude of compassion, uh, we're in sin, and our faith is not what God wants it to be. Uh, the imprecatory psalms are Hebrew poetry, which is often exaggerated. Whenever you read imprecatory psalms, don't take everything literally. And they are cries for the will of God to be done. Cries for the will of God to be done. Christians what want God to do what God has said he will do. Should we pray imprecatory prayers? I would encourage you to exercise extreme caution when applying these passages of Scripture. And know that praying to God, thy will be done, is sufficient to accomplish an imprecatory purpose. We should pray for God's will to be done, and we should pray for God to enact righteousness and justice according to his wisdom. C.S. Lewis wrote, The ferocious parts of the psalm serve as a reminder that there is in the world such a thing as wickedness and that it is hateful to God. Let's not become soft against sin. Let's love everyone, absolutely. Like God, we desire that all people should come to repentance and we show them love in hopes that they will be led to Christ. Let's love everyone. Let's hate sin, and let's desire that God's will be done above all else. Before you jump to apply the imprecations of Psalm 69, verses 22 to 28, to your own prayers, I encourage you to follow the example David set just a few verses earlier. As David wrote the imprecatory Psalms, his more harsh words towards others were preceded by extreme, extreme humility for himself. Psalm chapter 69, verse 5. David prayed, O oh God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. In the next verse, he said, Let those who hope in you not be put to shame through me, O Lord God of hosts. Let not those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, O God of Israel. David confessed his sin to God. He didn't try to hide it. And he was so concerned that his own sin would reflect poorly on God's people. Remember, the Psalms were sung publicly uh, by God's people. David was so vocal in admitting his sin, he had all of Israel sing about it. Before you look to the Psalms for imprecatory inspiration, look to them as reason to radically and humbly confess our own sins. Let's look at them as reason to confess our own sins. Let's have the attitude. Let's have the mindset David did. Let's confess our sins. Let's be concerned uh, that when we do sin, and if we have, how it will reflect on God's people, how it will reflect on the church. We've got to have that humility uh, before we speak out against others. We're offering an invitation to you tonight, urging you to confess sin publicly like David did. If you have never become a child of God, we want you to be added to the church. We want you to become a Christian. You can be baptized tonight and forgiven of your sins. If you were once baptized, but you are now continuing in sin, willfully unrepentant, uh, take note of the strong language used here in the Psalms and confess your sins like David. If you have a need, we would love to help you if you'd come to the front while we stand and sing.